Well, Matt Halstead is back with us again for another episode of uh, what Paul does with the Old Testament in his New Testament writings. And this time you're you're really, I, I don't know if you're biting, my, my impression of Romans 9 through 11 is everybody who bite, who does work here bites off more than they can chew. <laughs> I think there's no exceptions to that. So uh, I, I'm sure though that Again, for our listeners, if you have the Messianic profile in your head, we're just zeroed in on what Paul does with the Old Testament and how he reconfigures things through his, up, his, his own encounter with Jesus and how that's consistent with pre-Pauline or pre-Jesus Messianic speculation in the Jewish community. But Paul is, is mainstream in that sense, but he does you know, offer new material because he refracts everything through his his experience of the risen Christ on the way to Damascus. So, Matt, thanks for uh, being here with us again. And what exactly are we going to do now? Yeah, we're going to focus on Romans 9 and and just dabble very briefly in Romans 11. And you're right, a lot of people, when you get into Romans 9 through 11, tend to bite off too much than they can handle, right? And, And yet, what's interesting here is that Romans 9 is not just a self-contained unit. You you need Romans 11, and you read, need you need Romans 10, and of course then if you read Romans 9 through 11, you need Romans 2, and it just is so much. But we're going to do our best to really narrow the focus quite down to the, the concept of election. And I think that Paul, you know, Christologically reconfigures the concept of election as well. And so, like we said in the last episode, there's some freshness, some newness here, but but it's still uh, not inconsistent with the Old Testament of, of view as well. Um, the good thing, though, Mike, about this episode with uh, Romans 9 is we know that everybody will agree with us because everybody's in agreement <laughs> about Romans 9, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's good news. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah. Last couple of episodes on Romans, we've talked about how Paul reconfigures faith language, Torah language around the assumptions of the Messiah. He reconfigured the Abrahamic story around the Messiah too. We saw that in the last episode. And again, this episode, more reconfigurement happens, this time with the concept of election. Election is a concept that is reconfigured around Christ and the Christ people. So to introduce that whole thing, I think the best place to start is uh, toward the end of Romans 9, uh, and then we'll recircle at the beginning in a moment. But just to kind of see what's at stake here, Paul cites two texts from Hosea in Romans 9, 25 through 26. And it's a text that, I'm sorry, it's a quotation that that's a, a rather of a conundrum, really. And so many countless commentators, scholars, have commented on this and tried to make sense of this. There's really not a consensus. And uh, so it, it's a it's a fun place to begin, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna read this passage Romans nine twenty four through twenty six, and then I'll explain it, and and you'll see where the conundrum is. Okay, so I'll begin with verse twenty four. Paul says, it, 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 by the way, verse twenty four kind of starts off in in typical Pauline fashion with kind of a a break a break in thought from the previous verse, but we, we'll just start here. He says. Even us whom he has called, not only from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Okay, so this is just a little snippet of a much larger argument. So let me let me just break it down and explain it briefly. Paul's argument here with he, these quotations from Hosea, is is to make the argument, he's making the argument that Gentiles can be included into the new covenant family of God. The way this, this these quotations are constructed in the context of Paul's argument here makes it pretty clear that Paul is talking about the Gentiles. So when he quotes Hosea, who says, I will call the not my people my people, and the not loved loved, Paul's using that to say, I will call the Gentiles, who are not my people, you are my people. So he's he's applying that text to the Gentiles. Now, here's the conundrum. In the original context of Hosea, chapter 2, chapter 1, 
in that original context, Hosea uses that prophecy in these words to refer not to Gentiles, but to the rebellious tribes of Israel. So what Hosea is really doing in the original context is that he's prophesying that wayward Israel will be re-included in the covenant. But Paul uses this, this prophecy as an argument that Gentiles will be included in the covenant for the first time. So there's, there's, there's difference going on here between the original context and Paul's. What do you do with this? Well, again, as I said a moment ago, scholars are divided on this, not sure what to do with it. Uh, one, one scholar says that, um, it's humorous almost, that, that Paul just chose the wrong verse to argue for the right thing or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, you have, you have that view. But let me, let me go through sort of a, a, a tour of the views here of how scholars have made sense of this. The first view is just very simple. Paul unilaterally imposes his own assumptions onto the text so that it can mean whatever he wants it to mean at the time. You know, some scholars, uh, you know, might, well, I'm thinking of one scholar, he, he, and this scholar is not a relativist in the sense that I've might, might have made it out to be, you know, he doesn't think Paul is making the text mean whatever he wants it to mean, but he, he says that Paul is, is approaching this text with a new covenant awareness uh, that allows him to give it some new meaning. Okay, that, that's interesting. Um, and, and one, one I, guess, I guess initially I would say I, I like that. I think there's something like that going on. But the, but the problem ultimately with, with that view in particular, and again, for more context, you have to read my book on, on his view. But the problem with that view is that it, it really doesn't take into account how Paul appeals to that text as the basis for his argument. In other words, he, it, Paul doesn't seem to be merely reading his new covenant awareness into the text, but he's rather using this text to argue for a new covenant awareness. He's arguing from the text, right? So that needs to be taken into account. I mean, as I said, it is true that I think Paul is reading Christological assumptions into the text, and talk about that more in a bit. But this can't be an excuse to disregard the way in which Paul employs the original Hosea text as the basis for his argument, okay? Um, so I think what we need is a way to make sense of how Paul can read out of the text just as much as he can read into it, okay? And some proposals that I've seen uh, from scholars, you know, don't balance those two needs out the best. Um, okay, so that's the first view. The second view just simply says, well, okay, Hosea's text originally meant to include the Gentiles. So if Paul's applying it to the Gentiles later, then, um, then there's no problem. Well, the problem, though, with that view is that it's just so hard to substantiate. We, we really can't know, for example, what Hosea was thinking. And we can't really, like, crawl into his mind and examine the corners of his, of his thought. All we have is his text. And his text doesn't seem to give us reason to think that he was forecasting Gentile inclusion. He was, again, talking about Jewish re-inclusion. And, and in my opinion, I think to suggest that Hosea originally meant to include Gentiles is like saying that those passages in the Old Testament that speak about a Mashiach or a Messiah, they were all about Jesus. Right? And like we've seen in the past episodes, those views would be mistaken to say that. Um, you know, we can't go back and make Hosea's context fit our expectations because we need it to, right? So um, we, 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 need to, we need to be cautious of that. The, the original context needs to be our guide in more ways than one. Okay, but you know, there, I think yeah. we have to acknowledge there's, there's no problem with saying the original context for this Old Testament passage was X. And along the way, this, you know, along the way, this is how it got fulfilled. And so Paul uses it to say why. He's, he's still attached to it. Right. I, I, very don't much know, so. I don't know if I'm saying that very well, but it, there's, there's no crime in saying both. Right. Yeah. 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 You, we, we can say both, I think. And, and again, that goes back to balancing out both, uh, you know, what we, um, what we examine in the original context and what Paul's doing in a new context. And we, we, we can balance those two things out. You know, at the very least, I don't think it's wise to jump to the conclusion that Paul is a, just a bad reader of scripture. I mean, I think we should give him the benefit of the doubt here. And, and, you know, once we get into a book like Romans or Galatians or any of his letters, we find that he's actually a very careful reader. There's a strategy behind his interpretations, and there's a logic, there's a rhythm, there's a cadence to his quotations 
that I think we will fail to see if we just jump to the conclusion up. Oh, see, context says this, and then Paul's doing this. You know, throw our hands up in the air, Paul's a bad reader. Okay, well, <laughs> let's back up and give him the benefit of the doubt. And if there is data to suggest that he's a careful reader of Scripture, then we'll, then we'll go with that. And as it turns out, I think there is good data to suggest that. So, yeah, kind of, you know, going back to the whole Messiah, Mashiach example, just like those passages in the Old Testament that spoke about Messiah, you know, we can say that Hosea's original text, it still contributes to a new covenant profile, just like the Messiah texts contribute to a messianic profile, even though those Messiah texts don't really explicitly talk about a Messiah in the eschatological end time sense. So, um, so we want to, we want to, I guess, do the same thing. Uh, you know, we we want to see how the Hosea text here can contribute to the overall new covenant profile that Paul is working with. Okay, so um, okay, so the next view would be number three. Paul uses the Hosea text just like Hosea used them to refer to the Jews and not to Gentiles. So what this does is alleviate the problem by saying, okay, well. Paul's not talking about Gentiles here. He's just talking about the Jews. He's talking about their re-inclusion too. I won't go into the details on all this, but it just really doesn't seem plausible grammatically. Given how the Hosea text is introduced in Romans 9.24, and given how later, just a few verses later, Paul will actually cite Isaiah to make a case for Jewish inclusion uh, in a couple of verses later. So it seems like, just given the construction that Paul clearly is using Hosea to argue for Gentile inclusion, and then immediately after that, using Isaiah to argue for the, the inclusion of Jews. I don't want to get into all the details, but, but just, you know, I encourage the readers to go back and read those, uh, those, that passage and just kind of see how Paul sets it up. It, it seems pretty clear to me. Um, okay, the fourth option would be uh, to say what we said earlier, that Paul simply chose the wrong passage to make his argument. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, one scholar suggested that Paul should have used this Hosea quotation in Romans 11, where he does argue for Jewish re-inclusion. Uh, this scholar says, you know, Paul just simply messed up. He made a mistake by putting it here in Romans 9 instead of chapter 11. But the problem blame, I have with that... Blame it on the, you know, blame it on the bungling scribe, the, <laughs> the, blund, the blundering amanuensis or something. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, in Old Testament scholarship, that's common. We 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 always talked about the the bungling redactor. Right. Yeah. And if there's ever a problem in there, it's his <laughs> fault. Well, just just to alleviate concerns from anybody who might have them, there's no evidence to to think that this is <laughs> that that has happened here. <laughs> when you look at all the texts, but but more than just that, really, I mean, like it it just, this doesn't doesn't seem plausible. It doesn't seem plausible that Paul would not have noticed his own blunder here because, you know, the, it's, it's a very blunder that some modern scholars claim to know. And, and, and as I said before, uh, Paul has every mark of a careful and very respectful reader of Scripture that I just I highly doubt that he wouldn't have noticed his mistake here if it was a mistake. Given how close proximity Romans 9 is to Romans 11 and given how Romans 9 and 11 really go hand in hand, it just doesn't. It doesn't seem to make sense uh, with with you know the overall argument. I just don't think Paul did that. So I, again, I want to give Paul the benefit of the doubt here. I I, I want to look at all the data. I want to look at all the textual evidence, and mm -hmm. and if, if there's something there that can make sense of what Paul's doing, I'm going to go with it. If there's no data there to to help me out, okay, then logically this might be a live option. But you know I've I've researched this for years, and I I, I just don't. I don't think this is a live option. I think people jump to it too quickly. And I, I do want to say, though, that, you know, I, it, is a, it is a minority view that Paul chose the wrong scripture here. Most commentators are going to find ways around to how to make sense of this. Okay, so I don't want to make this view sound like it has more adherence than it does. The fifth view, and it's an interesting view, is that what Paul is doing is just principalizing. And the, the point is, is that Paul is using Hosea in such a way that he's not denying Hosea's original meaning. He's just simply drawing a principle out of it. Kind of like, just like God can re-include the Jews, you know, a.k.a. Hosea. Mm -hmm. Well, he can also include the Gentiles, you know. And I get that. I, I, like, I like that idea. I think there's actually some truth to it. 
But the problem with this view is that it doesn't seem to capture the full force of the quotation in its rhetorical context. And, and uh, here's what I mean. Paul seems to quote Hosea here as foretelling the inclusion of the Gentiles. I mean, notice again how he introduces the quotation itself. I mean, you know, the audience can go back and read that in Romans 9, 24. He seem, Paul seems to think that Hosea is predicting this or something, or something to that effect. And, and one scholar, I think it was Doug Moo in his Romans commentary, it's since been revised for a second edition. I know in the first edition he says this. He says that, you know, that really the problem with the principalizing view is that Paul needs more than a simple principle to make the sort of claims he's making, right? Uh, in, in order to be persuasive, I think I think that's that's the case. I think Paul is doing more than just saying, hey, guys, here's a principle we can look at. I mean, the the problem really with the principalizing view is that, you know, if it's true, then what Paul is really saying is that, guys, just because God can do something, therefore he is doing that something, you know, just because God can, in principle, call the Gentiles, it, it doesn't imply that he is, in fact, calling the Gentiles, right? I mean, you know, just because God can make a planet, a distant exoplanet, you know, be teeming with unicorn life doesn't mean there actually is a exoplanet that's teeming with unicorn life, right? So um, it's just it's just not a persuasive argument uh, to say that just because God can in principle do something that he is in fact doing it. Okay, so my conclusion really is that, you know, n neither of these proposals really seem to capture that hermeneutic logic that Paul is operating by. Um, some of these approaches I do think come close and some of them aren't entirely wrongheaded. But at the end of the day, I think they do fall short in some way, way or another. And I think we need a hermeneutic that, that can account for all of the data. And again, like I say in my book, I, I, I say this almost verbatim how I'm going to say it here, but we need a hermeneutic that is flexible enough to account for how Paul does go beyond Hosea's original meaning, but mm -hmm. one that is also stable enough so that we don't turn Paul into a textual relativist who, again, thinks he can make the Bible mean whatever he wants it to mean. Uh, and, and another way to put that is to say we need a way to account for how Paul can read his assumptions into Hosea's text and a way to account for how Paul can appeal to the text as the basis for his argument. So how can, how can Paul do that? How can he argue from a text that he reads assumptions into? And again, I have a whole section on my book on how that might, might work, um, but we won't get into that, the philosophical stuff. But for, for our purposes today, I, I simply want to offer that same storied approach that we've been talking about for many episodes now, that I think Paul reads Hosea as being part of that overall story of Israel as the rescue plan for the world. And it's the story of Israel that, that also says Israel herself needs to be rescued and that she's in need of grace. And in fact, I think Paul will outline how Israel herself has always been in need of grace, that, that even her election, her calling was based on grace. And, and I think but I think for Paul, the term Israel really becomes a term that simply means that entity that is elected by grace. And, and as a result of that, I don't think there's any way Israel can boast. Paul, Paul excludes boasting. Israel cannot boast. And, and the Gentiles who are in Christ, you know, they, they can rightfully claim elected status too. Uh, but they can't boast either because they're included like Israel was by grace. And I think once we trace that line of thought, I think we can better understand how Paul would be motivated to quote Hosea in the way that he did. Okay, so so we've laid out, you know, this conundrum of a quotation. Now, now let's go back to the beginning of Romans 9 and mm -hmm. see how Paul is reading the story of Israel uh, and, and, and how he's reconfiguring it Christologically. So those two things need to be kept in mind as we proceed. He's reading, he's, he's retelling the story of Israel and uh, their election, and he's going to do it uh, Christologically, and in, 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 he's going to end Christologically. But okay, let me read Romans 9, 1 to 5. That's the introduction to, to this text. Paul says, quote, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, you know, the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So I just want to say 
on this real briefly that Paul has a high view of Israel, of ethnic Israel. He has a very high view of them. They are privileged in that they were entrusted with the covenants. We just read that. Uh, it was through them came the Messiah. And from this point on, Paul will give all of his readers a history lesson about how Israel came to be elected in the first place. And what he's going to say is that they were elected by grace, not by works of Torah. And this is where we get into uh, the next section, Romans 9, 6 through 13. Paul says here, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But, quote, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And that's a quotation from the Old Testament there. And, and then he goes on, Paul says, This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, quote, About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. Another quotation uh, from the Old Testament. So let me let me just you know, share share what Paul's doing here. Paul, in that text we just read, bases Isaac's inheritance of the Abrahamic covenant on the divine promise. And if you know the story, in all actuality, Isaac should never have been born, naturally speaking. His birth was a miracle, and it was brought about by divine promise. And Paul interprets this to mean that Abraham's children should not be relegated to natural descent either. So there's a, there's, a, there's a supernatural element to what it means to be a child of God. And what Paul's doing here is hinting toward Gentile inclusion via Christ. And he's, he's doing that, but he's not actually saying it yet. But that's where he's going. Just like Isaac came about through Abraham and Sarah supernaturally and without regard to natural effort in, in the sense that we think but through divine miracles. So also, we, you know, Paul's, Paul's going to say that we shouldn't push the ethnic, the, 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 we shouldn't base election on ethnicity, you know, toward natural descent either. It's all about God's promise and God's spoken word that that election is defined. Okay, so, and, and then right after this, Paul will go on to tell the story of Isaac's own children, Jacob and Esau. And the question going into this text we need to ask is which one will receive the covenant promise and the answer is really surprising because in uh, verses 10 11 through 10 11 12 13 it says this and not only so but also when rebecca had conceived children by one man our forefather isaac even though they were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad in order that god's purpose of election might continue not because of works but because of him who calls she was told quote the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So Paul is continuing that standard way of telling the Jewish story. It was Jacob, not Esau, who receives the promises and the covenant of Abraham. But really, this is remarkable. I mean, it really is because Jacob was not firstborn. His birth and his lineage as secondborn gave priority to his brother Esau. Esau was firstborn. So Jacob, and by the way, we should remember that Jacob is really Israel. His name is later changed to Israel. But Jacob, and, and by extension Israel, is the runt of the family, right? And yet, God had a plan, a purpose of election to make Jacob and Israel the recipient of the covenant. Before he could perform any works of Torah, he was chosen. God set his covenant love on Jacob, not Esau. And, and I know we, we could chase his, you know, a million rabbit trails here, but I do want to say something here about the text from Malachi that says, you know, God hated Esau. We touched on this in our Malachi episode, but, but it's worth saying again here. When it says that God hated Esau, I don't think we should take that in, this, in, the, in the sense of emotional hate like we might think. We, we should take this rather with respect to the covenant, uh, not, not in terms of personal hate. I think this is hyperbolic in many ways. It's a, a purposeful exaggeration to make a point. And, and one, one text I might use as parallel here is that, you know, nobody thinks that when Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, that he cannot be my disciple. Nobody thinks that when Jesus says that, that he actually means hate, right? It's, it's hyperbole, purposeful exaggeration. So I don't think God literally hates Esau. And, and again, we talked about this in the Malachi episode, but um, Paul quotes from Genesis 25 here. And again, if you look at that text, it clearly refers to Jacob and Esau as nations. 
And so the same goes for the quotation from Malachi, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. This is about na- nations and national election. It's not about individuals, right? Yeah, he's doing, he's doing a, a pretty poor job of hating them if, he, if the whole point is to redeem them in the end anyway. Exactly. And see, the moment we, you know, narrow the focus down to just, you know, individuals and, you know, God's personal hatred or something is the minute we've neglected to exegete the larger story that's being told, right? And and we have to let the larger meta narrative that, that we've been talking about a lot, we have to allow that to to guide our reading here. And uh, and if we don't, we we really get off on the wrong foot quick. My my opinion here, and I know this is where everybody's going to agree with me, <laughs> but Paul's point really has nothing to do with individual election. Like those are modern debates. I think I think. I think Paul's point is much more profound. I think I think he's saying that Israel, like her forefathers Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel has no reason to boast. They were they were nothing when God elected them to their vocation of being the rescue plan for the world. And in Jacob's case in particular, Israel is reminded, Israel the nation is reminded that she is second born. You know, mm-hmm. she's not by virtue of her lineage, she's not in a privileged position. And I think what Paul is doing here is he's hinting subtly with a wink in his eye. He's saying that Israel should not boast now, especially over her Gentile colleagues. Just because the Gentiles are second in line to Israel, so what? Does that mean that they're outside of the bounds of God's covenant inclusion? No, 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 no. For, because that was the case of Israel. Israel was second born. She was the runt. You know? So the point here is that God can do whatever he wants with his covenant. He can, and, and his mercy, he can bring mercy and compassion on the Gentiles if that's what he so chooses. It's his mercy. He can call Gentiles into the vocation of election if that's his plan. As it turns out, that's his plan, but he can do whatever he wants. And and that's the subject of the next passage. It, 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 gets, it gets really convoluted if you, if you start seeing this outside of the storied approach that we've been crafting. But I, I do want to go ahead and read it because, and it, let me just read it and I'll make some comments on it again. But this is where Romans 9, 14 through 21 says that God can do whatever he wants to with his mercy. So, so let's read it. It says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, quote, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to the molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Okay, I, just, I, just, I don't want to chase a rabbit trail too much here, but I, I, do, I do need to address it. Um, I, you know, again, I don't want to get caught up in uh, second century or modern debates about free will and determinism here. I don't think any of Paul's discussions here, you know, affirm a deterministic view of individual election. I think the emphasis is still national election. And by the way, if we don't see that, then we won't you, understand. Yeah. I was going to say, could you say the emphasis is vocational election? Yeah, that's a better term. I, I, I kept saying national election, but vocational election is better. And that actually raises a good point, Mike, because if we don't see this as national or, or vocational election, then then we will not be on the right track later on for how to understand those Hosea passages where the Gentiles, you know, mm-hmm. become part of the the, the elect ones, right? Yeah, if we, God's if we, still looking to, to work the rescue plan. It's right. going to be through Israel, but not all Israel is Israel. You know? <laughs> right. And the way, and this is where Romans 11 comes in, the way God in his wisdom does all that is remarkable. But anyway, we'll postpone that for just a few minutes later. But um, I think the emphasis is still on vocational election. And I think one proof of this is the whole hardening motif. Um, so I don't think hardening a Pharaoh, you know, I don't think it should be treated as deterministic in the sense that we think. I think, and Mike, you might have more to say on this than I do, but I, the original context of Pharaoh's hardening in Exodus doesn't seem to speak of like a unilateral hardening on the part of God. I mean, it's clear that I think God hardens 
uh, Pharaoh, but I don't think it's just all God in, in, in that sense. I think Pharaoh is a pretty hard-hearted dude from the beginning anyway. Yeah, I mean, ba- ba- when we went through Exodus, we basically concluded that that God already knew what this guy was about. Mm-hmm. He knew the condition of his heart already because there are, there are indications of him hardening himself. Exactly, and yeah, that, 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 that would Pharaoh, be nice. Pharaoh was the guy he was in the Exodus story for a long time, and God knew it. Right. That's exactly right. And I think I think Paul might give us some insight on how hardening works anyway. I mean, I, I, in my opinion, again, maybe someone could debate this, um, but in my opinion, I don't think we need to speculate about what Paul means by hardening at all, because in Romans 1, at the very beginning of the book, he he tells us how it works. Hardening is God's way of responding to an ongoing willful rebellion. You know, this is why God will say, because, you know, Romans 1, because, you know, they have done this and that, God gave them up to their rebellious hearts, you know, in, in, in a debased mind. Hardening is is God's way of not overriding a person's free will, but actually confirming it and affirming it, right? And giving them what they want, which is not exactly a good good thing sometimes. But interestingly enough here, too, I think this view of, of hardening is pretty consistent even with the pottery image that Paul uses later. Which uh, actually Paul uses it in the in the passage we just read about God can do anything he wants to. He's the potter and we're the clay, right? Well, Paul doesn't get that out of thin air. I mean, that's a that's a a, a concept that comes from Jeremiah chapter eighteen. And if you go back and read Jeremiah eighteen, uh, I think the pottery image and the potter imagery it actually works against a Calvinist determinist view because in 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 the context there. According to Jeremiah 18, God forms and shapes people based on their decision. I mean, it, it's pretty clear in that context. It's what God's doing. Like, he, you know, he'll start off by saying, like, if 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 the people do this and they repent, then I'll do this. You know, if I'm shaping you for destruction, but if you repent, then I'm going to have mercy on you. So it's really interesting. Uh, just I just encourage the audience to go back and read Jeremiah 18 in light of. Uh, I'm sorry, read Paul in light of Jeremiah 18. Um, the, the last thing I'll say to you here on this is. I don't think the concept of hardening here is eternal anyway. Paul is very clear on this in Romans 11. I think Israel's hardening, you know, first of all, it's spoken in, in uh, corporate terms, not individualistic, but, um, but Israel's hardening, hardening is temporary. And, and uh, you know, apparently in Paul's theology, those who are hardened can still be saved. It's not eternal reprobation that we often see in some of the more Calvinistic schemes of things. Um, you know, the, you know, Calvinists often talk about election to salvation, but then the opposite of that is the so-called dark side of Calvinism, where it talks about eternal reprobation and divine hardening for eternity, right? Well, as soon as we go down that path is, is the moment we, we get outside of what Paul's doing, because Paul doesn't speak of eternal reprobation. This is, I mean, when he, when he does talk about, you know, the timing and the extent of reprobation here, or uh, the hardening, it's, it's, you know, he calls it temporary, right? So something, I just think something else is going on, but we won't belabor the point. He goes on Romans 9, verse 21, down to, I guess, down to verse 26. He says, uh, Paul says, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said of them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. So here's our text that we began with. By the time Paul has gotten to this passage, his Jewish readers, I think, would most likely have been in agreement with him, but only up until the point he quotes Hosea. Because the meaning he gives these quotations, as we talked about, they probably would have been controversial, I think. I think Paul's interpretive logic with the Hosea quotations and and the meaning that he finds in them, it's based on his Christology. And I think that's the defining factor, and we'll get to that in a moment. But the point I just want to make here is that when Paul throws these out uh, to to his Jew- Jewish readers, at least, they're going to like wave a, wave a red flag and say, 
okay, what are you doing? Because that, you know, if they were familiar with the context, they would know this is about Jews. You know, we were with you up until this point, Paul. Yeah, we were chosen by grace and so forth. But, uh, but you know, what exactly is going on? But we'll see that in just a moment. It's because of his Christology. It's because of what he already believes about Jesus. Um, he believes Jesus is the fulfillment of all those messianic expectations. And he also thinks that everyone associated with Christ can be considered in the covenant that is, you know, considered righteous. Okay, so I want you to consider this next passage. This comes from Romans 9, 27 down, all the way down to chapter 10, verse 4. Okay, let me read it. It says, And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? Listen to this part. That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law with, that would lead to righteousness, they did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's a quotation from Isaiah. And then he goes on in chapter 10. Paul says, brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God is for them to be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Literally there, Christ is the telos of the law, the culmination of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, let me explain what we've just read. Gentiles, according to Paul, have become included in the covenant because he says they pursued covenant status by faith. Now, Israel has not. She, she has not pursued it by faith. And all of this leaves the Gentiles in the same position as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So, so you know, just like Abraham, the Gentiles are included in the covenant by faith. We've already talked about this. So it would be odd, wouldn't it, to exclude the Gentiles from the covenant when in all reality they are doing nothing different than the patriarchs did, namely believe in Yahweh and what Yahweh has done. But, but again, it's good to remind us that the words faith and believing on the part of the Gentiles is always Christologically oriented. In other words, they are only in because they are united to Christ. And, and this is the reason many Jews, you know, they have they failed to become true covenant members. They have not recognized the messianic ministry of Jesus. Paul's Christological interpretation of that stone passage in Isaiah that we just read, that's the basis for his entire thought here. For Paul, covenant membership is based upon, you know, a person's response to the Christ event. So, Remember the Isaiah passage. I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Those passages from Isaiah there that, that are quoted, you know, they're interpreted by Paul to, to, in messianic ways and as Christologically oriented. So if you want to be in the covenant, then you need to do something with Christ. You need to believe in him. And if you if you do not believe in him, you won't be in covenant. So I like to say that Paul's Messiah, Paul's Christ, is the axis upon which the covenant promises uh, rotate. They, you know, everything revolves around the Christ. Everything's reconfigured around Christ, even the concept of election. And see, I think when we have all that in our mind, that's how we can see how Paul can legitimately apply Hosea's passage to the Gentiles. Not because Hosea was necessarily meaning to include them, but rather it's because believing Gentiles have become Israel by their inclusion into Christ so that they can legitimately be the reference to the Hosea passage. So, Okay, so in, yeah, in one sense, yes, Paul is going beyond Hosea. He's giving the text new meaning, and it would have been shocking to the Jewish readers when they read this part of Romans 9. But Paul is by no means running against the grain of the story of Scripture. Remember, the story of Scripture is what we've been saying all along, that number one, mm -hmm. humanity needs rescuing. Number two, Abraham's family is elected by grace to be the rescue plan, to be blessed, and to be a blessing to the nations. Number three, but Israel cannot rescue the world because she needs rescuing. And then number four, God rescues Israel by bringing about a true Israel, Israelite, the Messiah, the branch, the servant, the messenger. And Paul believes that this Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one who blessed 
uh, who blesses and rescues the nations. He blesses and rescues Israel, which you remember, not only is Abraham's family going to rescue the world, but the servant of Isaiah is going to rescue Israel. That's a very important thing here. And anyone, this is, and this is very important, anyone who is in Messiah for Paul, anyone in Messiah gets to participate in that rescue plan. And I'll just kind of end with this little thought you know, on that note. How, how does, what does he mean? How does everybody participate in the rescue plan? Well, this is where we can jump briefly to Romans 11, because we see that Paul is thinking along that, that line that everybody gets to participate in the rescue plan if they're in Christ. So in Romans 11, Paul says that the Jews hardening their rejection of the Messiah has ironically brought about the inclusion of the nations. In other words, Paul says that their disobedience has brought a blessing to the nations. And these Gentiles who become believers in Christ end up, through their inclusion in the covenant, they end up driving Israel to jealousy and hence re-inclusion into the covenant. So these Christian Gentiles, you know, true Israel, they end up blessing ethnic Israel by bringing them back into the fold. And, and in this way, all of Israel is saved. In this way, Israel becomes the very entity that was promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, that Israel would be both blessed and that she will be a blessing. That fulfills the Abrahamic covenant. And so Paul presents a reconfigured concept of election. It's reconfigured Christologically, and it's one that is consistent with the storied approach of Scripture. That's how I, that's how I understand what's going on here. Do you still, would you still say that Israel for Paul in Romans 9 through 11 has more than one meaning in, in places? Yeah, I do. Yeah. But sometimes it's used to refer to ethnic Israel. Sometimes it's used to refer to yeah. Because he almost, Paul almost threatens the church, the circumcision neutral church, with the same, you know, hardening and setting aside, you know, hypothetically, that the, the, the church shouldn't be boasting either. The same thing could happen to them. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like they, they have no reason to boast because, you know, once they see Paul's argument that Israel is, you know, not as holy as maybe she thought she was, you know, and that she is really the runt, right? If, if they're following along that argument, then the Gentiles might say, huh, well, look at us, you know, we're crafted in, we didn't yeah. go through exile and we, you know, well, that's where Paul has strong words to say, um, hold on, just remember that you being grafted in is is uh, something that it would just well you've been grafted in right you're you're not a part of the original root yeah and so if if that's the case you can be chopped off pretty easy <laughs> and if and if you if you're comparing if you're pairing the group that was grafted into quote unquote Israel then in some sense you'd have to be referring to national Israel there yeah because he talks about it's a both and it is a both and and he talks about this nourishing root of the olive tree, and and this is in Romans 11, verse 17. And, and kind of the way I understand all of this is that you have the root, right, which might have something to do with the Abrahamic covenant, the initial, mm -hmm. the initial covenant, you know, Abraham, Genesis 12. And then you have what grows out of that. What you about know, I mean, root is certainly Davidic language, but the Davidic yep. language gets married to Abrahamic language anyway. True, absolutely, yeah, and it, it includes all of those promises because even David is—he's in in that same line, right? We've talked about that before. How, you know, God narrows narrows down everything not only through Israel but through David's family as well. So there's some continuity there. So I think I would interpret that as really all of those maybe covenants, those initial covenants, especially especially though with the patriarchs. But but then out of that comes you know Israel ex in exile, Israel as the the nation that has sinned. And then, and then, so they have been hardened. So they're, you know, but, but then, but then you have Gentiles who believe in Christ and they're put into that. And yet you still have the, the natural people. They're kind of left out, but Paul says they're going to come back in. And, and so you kind you kind of have three different entities sort of going on. And I rec recognize that, that this is metaphor. Paul is crafting an illustration. And so I don't know if he's m meaning to, He's, if he's meaning for it to be parsed out in such literal detail here, but, you know, or to be pressed and to, to walk on all fours, if you will. But I think he, I think you can sort of see three different things. So I, I like to talk about, you know, just Israel as that entity that is a, is both blessed and is a blessing. 
and and that's an entity that ethnic Israel can choose to be part of, or mm-hmm. that the, they, they may not be right. And so, so and then the Gentiles can be part of that too. And and again, that that kind of gives us three entities here almost, right? But I don't want to press that too much. Um, but anyway, uh, but the, the remarkable thing for me is is how Paul how Paul's logic works out in all of that, because he, he, you know, as I read, he goes on to say that, that it's because uh, it, it, ethnic Israel ends up blessing the Gentiles because of her disobedience, you know, because her disobedience has led Gentiles into the covenant, but that mm-hmm. being led into the covenant ends up being a blessing to wayward Israel who becomes jealous and comes back into the covenant. And so really this entity that we're calling Israel really does become blessed and is a blessing uh, God's plan is is brought to fruition through even even not only obedience but acts of disobedience. God still weaves in His plan. Yeah, um, I, tend to, I tend to think modern scholarship sometimes because we couldn't have conceived it as to how all these things would play out. Yeah, that we we get sort of offended when when we see it in Scripture and want to deny it. You know, it just you yeah. want to say that Paul Paul is doing something fishy here when. No. Just, just because you, this wouldn't have popped into your head doesn't mean that it, you know, right. doesn't mean that it's inconsistent. Exactly, exactly, and yeah, I think I've said this before, but it's not fair to judge a pre-modern, pre-enlightenment interpreter like Paul. It's not fair mm-hmm. to judge him by enlightenment standards, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, enlightenment standards are much more. Uh, analytical that you know there's not a lot of emphasis on stories and things like that and Paul is a storied thinker and so mm-hmm. he's going to be factoring in all of that here and and in terms of Christology I, Paul's Christology is the the axis on which all of this is spinning you know the you know whether it's the the hardening of the ethnic Jews I mean they're Paul you know they're hardened because they've stumbled over the stone like hardening is essentially another way of saying that they've not believed in Jesus and whatnot They've, they've they're outside of that of that covenant and why they don't believe in Jesus well okay well then how did the Gentiles get in by believing in Jesus by by building on the stone by not stumbling on the stone which is Jesus and so it's all Christological and so that's how I think Paul is has reconfigured this whole concept of election or in other words he's reconfigured the whole concept of Israel around the Messiah. But as soon as you say that, we want to remind ourselves that, yeah, but this reconfigurement was was long predicted and anticipated uh, in that messianic profile that we've been crafting and observing. Yeah. Well, again, this is good stuff. I mean, Romans 9 through 11 is is pretty, pretty they're, they're, they're deep waters here. But again, I think you did a good job of showing that, you know, that Paul's understanding here is consistent with what we get in the Old Testament. But it, once again, he's reconfiguring everything through Christ and his his experience of the Christ encounter and, and what the scriptures, you know, really, really do say in hindsight. So I want to thank you again for being with us for the series. Well, thanks, Mike. I, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. <laughs>